Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the School of Radiance podcast. I'm your host, a humble human on a mission here to help you both look and feel your best. And in today's show, we're going to be talking about how we can sort of balance our lives, both personally and professionally. And I'm joined here today with, uh, with someone who is actually well integrated in the medical aesthetic space in particular. And we're going to get into the weeds of, you know, how Daniel Gao and myself kind of support the clients that we serve. And, you know, we're both involved with lots of different medical aesthetics practices and helping them grow. We're going to be talking about where we think that the industry is going as well. So this is going to be helpful for you to kind of discern what type of clinic is going to be good to go to, but also really some things to help you stay grounded and centered and aligned and have a peaceful life and a healthy life, no matter what you do, no matter what kind of business you're in. So this conversation is, is kind of like two entrepreneurs sharing what we do behind the scenes to stay on top and make those really beautiful connections with those who we serve. Daniel Gao is a senior strategist for EDNA Digital Marketing, a number one best-selling author, instructor for the Small Business Development Center, a division of the SBA, a sought-after guest speaker for national associations, business groups, and private companies in digital marketing. He has been in the digital marketing industry for eight years and teaching, speaking on the topic for five years. Previously, Daniel was a professional athlete in badminton, achieving a top rank of number one in the U.S. and number 82 in the world, and chosen for the U.S. national team on multiple occasions. Welcome, 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 Daniel Gao to the School of Radiance podcast. Let's first kiss, kick things off with the unlimited dollar question. What is Radiance to you? Yeah, Rachel, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. So I would say Radiance for me is really being in alignment. So both as an individual and also being a uh, business owner, I think alignment is the most important thing. Like when we look in our company and the people that we want to bring on for our team, we really look at core values which is, are we aligned with the people we are bringing on our team? Because when you work with a team, it's you're spending most of your waking hours with that person. And so I think core values is a big part of that and making sure that we are same culturally, uh, the same, we value the same things because we're gonna be spending most of our time together. And I even think that on a personal level, your significant other, your spouse, your children, you should really strive to make sure that you're in alignment you have those same core values because that's really where you're going to enjoy life, where you're going to get along and just can get the most out of each other and yourself. It's really important to find that common ground. So when we're looking at discerning who to make connections with both personally and professionally, I would also say that with the radiant stuff, we're really looking at actually health first and foremost. How does someone's skin look? How do they speak? How do they carry themselves? Are they organized in their lives for looking at who to bring into the team and and expand and grow and all of that? So I have a question for you. Since you're also involved in the medical aesthetic space, working with other practitioners and practices, I know that you and I have uh, had a chance to do a previous interview on your show where I sort of shared my opinion of where I think the industry is going. But for those listening who are curious about, you know, what's available, what's on the horizon, I would love to hear from you. Where do you think the industry is going for rejuvenation, for longevity, for achieving optimal and powerful health and wellness? Yeah. So what I'm seeing both myself and also a lot of other medical practitioners that I talk to across the country, it seems like the most common theme is that people are going towards more natural wellness or natural looks. So kind of back in the day, especially from an aesthetic side, people would get a little bit more done up. You kind of would know that they had some work done, but it seems like more and more people want to go for that natural look and they want to get away from the overdone, the Beverly Hills, puffy, like bad celebrity job look. Um, So I think that's one thing. It's more natural, but I think it's not just the natural look. I think it's also the natural treatments that people are looking more and more towards. And I'm kind of seeing this more, a lot more practice are bringing in these more natural treatments, regenerative medicine, um, functional medicine. And they're not looking just from the aesthetic point, just the 
what's on the skin surface. It's more of how can we fix you internally so that you look great on the outside. So I think that's just one area that the industry is going into. And I think just with the technology, um, it's really going in that area. I think it's not going to be too long also before practices start bringing in some aspect of um, food into it as well. So because I'm from what I've seen, what I've researched, um, there's a lot more people talking about the benefits of food and making sure that what you're eating and what you're not eating is really going to help you overall from wellness. And from that wellness, it's going to help you from an aesthetic side as well. So I think more natural, more regenerative medicine, more functional medicine, and even I think food is going to start playing a bigger and bigger role when people go in to get some type of aesthetic procedure or something aesthetically done. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. I started in the industry in 2011. And at that point, really, there wasn't a lot happening with the space of food coaching and lifestyle coaching. It was, okay, here are your options. Chemical peel, neuromodulators, fillers, microneedling, lasers, surgery. And I started to actually see a shift. And I'd probably say about 2017, 2018, so many more people were reaching out to me and saying that they didn't want to do injectables. They wanted to look at a way to restore their collagen and elastin, reduce pigmentation, skin redness, slow the signs of aging, you know, take back 10 years, uh, look kind of how they were maybe more 10 years ago, which is available with today's technology in medical aesthetics clinics for sure. However, there has been this trend towards more practitioners. Actually, I think this is where it comes from. And you, I'm going to ask you some of these questions, what you're doing behind the scenes as well. But I think it it really came from the practitioners and also the demand from the population to look at other options to get the best results possible. And I started to observe this, especially with biohackers that would come to see me and they would have faster recovery. And it's so neat to see with the laser side of things, how things are evolving and advancing quite quickly. It's like every couple of years, there's a new innovative uh, piece of technology to help with more collagen, elastin and pigmentation. But I do have this, you know, six to seven year rule. I like things to be on the market for a while uh, before I really start to offer it in my practice as well. That's a rule of thumb that's actually very much served me well. So we avoid the trends. You also mentioned something interesting about people not wanting to look overdone. I would say if you're listening and you live in a larger metropolitan area, you're more likely to see uh, other clinics sort of doing this more overdone look. And that can stem from the desire of someone wanting to look a certain way in certain circles to kind of make it obvious that they can afford to have rejuvenation. And, you know, the provider should be saying no, or, hey, maybe let's focus on doing some skin resurfacing, getting some collagen instead of putting another CC of filler in the lips because your lips are already full enough. They're within those ideal ratios. So I do see that trend in bigger cities. The peptide stem cells, exosomes, weight loss. We all know that weight loss has been hugely popular, especially um, with some of the peptides for that. But the, the food, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that with a lot of these practices offering sort of this medical weight loss option, there needs to be a discussion around foods. And with a lot of the nurses that, that I teach, and I'm sure that you experience this too, they're wanting to integrate that. But it also comes down to the person on the other end being receptive to that, being willing to make the shifts in their lifestyle, because there's this overlap with health and looking a certain way in rejuvenation that everyone just wants that quick fix. Mm -hmm. And in terms of quick fixes, what do you think the next quick fix is uh, coming down the pipeline in the medical aesthetics industry? Um, I mean, I think quick fixes, I'm almost looking at something like related to hormones. I think that something like that can be a very quick fix. Like we kind of maybe not hormone related, but you think about like the weight loss drug, some aglutide, tricepatide. I mean, it's an injection. I mean, it is a drug. It's an injection. And it can get people some very, very fast results when it comes to weight loss. So it is a quick fix because it's it's adjusting your chemical levels in your body. And I think everything is really related to the chemical levels. But the other part of that is, is it healthy? Is it good for you long term? Which I think 
whenever you think about anything quick fix, there's always going to be a negative attached to it. Maybe it's not something that you're going to see now, but maybe later on down the road. So I think that, of course, what you mentioned, everyone is looking for that quick fix. Everyone wants to have it done faster and, and cheaper and get a better result from it. But I think when most people think about it and they look at it, you have to think, okay, is your body really meant to go through this? And I think that's kind of the biggest thing of why people are going back to being more natural looking and looking at health more holistically. Because it's not a, oh, how do I take this shot to lose weight? Um, how do I take this medicine to fix my problem? Um, and I think that a big part of it is because the drug industry has become very uh, heavily monetized or their incentive to be very monetized. So your best, your health is not in their best interest. They'll get you result, long-term result. They're not too worried about. They can make money out of it. So I think it's really up to the individual to take that responsibility and also kind of take that their power back in their own hands is that if they want to live a long, healthy life, then I think they need to think, okay, I need to do this long-term. So, because if I do this long-term, I do it more natural, then I'm going to have a better quality of life. And I think that's really what I think your listeners should really be focusing on is good quality of life and doing it in a way where you can have, you can have the, the long-term benefits, um, but you're not looking just for that quick fix. So I think that's kind of one thing that they should really be looking at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's this whole, you know, other rabbit hole of practitioners that are really well suited to give the nutrition side of things through certifications, through going to conferences, through walking the walk and talking the talk themselves as well. There's also various tests that are available and, you know, some of these courses are better than others. Uh, so Daniel and I do have uh, some insights on that. Um, but I'm curious for you personally, because you and I are both really into caring for ourselves, running businesses, and really making sure we're surrounding ourselves with those other individuals that have shared values, good boundaries are great people to work with. This totally translates into your mm -hmm. personal life too, by the way. But a lot of you listening, you know, you have a job, you do something to make money. Uh, it's important to surround yourself with people who are, I would say, like-minded. And then obviously in, in my membership, I teach some strategies of how to navigate and negotiate with people that you will encounter that don't have those shared values, but still do it in a beautiful and graceful way where you know, everyone gets their needs met. So I'm curious to hear from you. You have this background of, of being an athlete. Now you're an entrepreneur. What do you personally do to stay on point in your life so that you still maintain your physical form while also, you know, ensuring that your, your profit and losses, you're looking at all of that, you're running a successful business. How do you like to stay on point in your life? Yeah, I think, well, I think my background has given me a lot of a head start on that being that athlete and being an athlete, you're always focused about your health, you're always focused on optimizing your health so you can perform at the highest levels. And I think it's no different being a business owner is that you need to perform at the highest levels all the time. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have your bad days, but most days, you're gonna have to be at that top level. And if you're not focusing on your health, both physical and mental, emotional, then that's going to suffer. So kind of things that I do is that I want to make sure that health is the very first thing I focus on because without health, you're not going to have anything else. You can be the richest person in the world. If you don't have the health, it doesn't really matter. So that's why I'm looking at health as being that number one thing that I have to focus on. And so from there, it just comes down to, I, I start looking around for people who I believe have the answer. Now that could be through a referral, some I'm, I'm talking to and they're really into health. So I ask them, hey, who have you listened to? Who have you learned from? And I get a name and I start reading their material. And then I kind of go down that rabbit hole of, oh, okay, if you read this, then you may also be interested in this person. And then you start looking at their videos on YouTube and then YouTube's gonna start recommending you other people. And I, you just kind of go down this rabbit hole and I learn more and more and more. Um, and But I think that what I struggled with, and I think what most people struggle with is, okay, who do I listen to? Um, we talked a little bit about the food being important for your health and wellness. And when I talk about 
food, I'm not talking about like going on a diet like the Atkins diet or the keto diet or anything along those lines, I think is what is overall like best practice. And so I learn from all these different people from a health perspective, and I try and kind of take what I think is sounds correct and try it out and see, does it work for me? So right now I'm, I'm reading a lot on gut health and the microbiome and kind of this is something that I've never even thought about previously, but it's about having a lot of variety in your diet, a lot of different types of fruits, a lot of different types of vegetables. Uh, they're talking about, you want to have 20 to 30 different types of fruits and vegetables every week, which Sounds like a lot, um, but I mean, if you plan it out, you can do it fairly well. Um, so I mean, that's just one part of the diet, like foods I'm trying to stay away from, the importance of sleep, um, the importance of breath work, um, even looking at like ice tubs, ice, ice baths, ice plunges, um, which can really help a lot as far as overall health and even weight loss, which I would have never thought. But I just kind of go down this rabbit hole. I learn from different people. I take what I what I, what sounds correct to me and I apply it to my life and see, does that work? And from there, that's how I'm able to stay kind of top of my game all the time, both as an athlete and even now as a business owner. For everybody tuning in here, when we're talking about body composition and especially in the rejuvenation space, I heard when I was doing, uh, getting some more of my credits for my specialty certification last year, that body contouring makes up only about 8% or less in a medical aesthetics setting, which is really interesting. So the body contouring with cryolipolysis, basically using cold to tell fat cells to undergo a process called apoptosis. We can do some, some sculpting to the body with different technologies, either using hot or cold. So when you said cold plunging and cold therapy, um, being used in, I notice weight loss uh, when I'm actually doing more cold therapy as well. Uh, horseback riders that ride in cold temperatures, they tend to have less saddlebags, no pun intended. Um, so it's funny when we start to do some of these things or notice, oh, this individual in this lifestyle is noticing these kind of results, what's going on there. That's actually where some of the medical aesthetics technology gets derived from. It's kind of been looked at for a couple of decades and then a product or a device is brought to market. So kind of interesting. The rabbit hole situation, this is a real thing. And for those of you listening, I'm sure you've experienced this. And just a little tip here, when you're going down a rabbit hole, what I want you to do is dip in and dip out. That's why tuning into the School of Radiance podcast is so helpful because I'm going to give it to you straight, talking about trends, where things are going so that you don't get overwhelmed and too extreme into anything in the health stuff uh, because I can tend to happen when people first start biohacking and optimizing their health. They get like really extreme and really strict and it can actually impact uh, things personally and professionally. I've seen this play out many times. It really is about putting your oxygen mask on first. That's really important. So in the aspect of self-care, no one's going to do this for you and hold your hand and walk you through it. Like you have to make those choices every day to avoid canola oil, drink two, three liters of water a day, make sure you're getting your body weight in grams of protein a day, looking at supplementation to get the active enzymes and nutrients and adaptogens from your Greens and fruits I actually fall a little bit more of a carnivore diet, and that's made a huge difference for me in regards to energy and body composition. So don't you think that's interesting that from the body composition side of things in med spas, it's less than 8% of the revenue of clinics? Yeah, I find it to be very, very surprising because you think with an aesthetic practice that it, the body would be the number one thing, I mean, aside from face, but uh, I mean, it is surprising. I would have thought body would have been a lot higher um, in comparison, but, um, uh, I mean, the numbers don't lie. So, and I think that kind of goes into a little bit more of telling of maybe what people are really looking for. Um, but I think with the, with especially some glutide that's come on the market very recently, um, I mean, the demand for some glutide has gone through the roof. So it could just be people were looking for more of a cost, um, a cost friendly alternative. And maybe they were looking at body contouring as, oh, maybe that's like the richer person's option, but not for me, the average person. But with semaglutide, now that's more in reach. And I think also the aesthetic practices are tapping more into almost like the diet market 
with semaglutide because if people are looking at, hey, I want to lose weight, they wouldn't look at body contouring as the first option. They probably look at a diet as the first option. And I think semaglutide is almost parallel to diet where it's, hey, I can take this shot. It's going to cost me a couple hundred dollars and then I can lose a bunch of weight and I don't have to work out or eat healthy. So I think it's almost a little bit more of the weight loss side. So, um, but I'd be interested interested to see just how much the percentage wise that weight loss and semaglutide is starting to become in a lot of aesthetic practices. Yeah, I actually think it's going to overshadow the body contouring technologies out there. And yeah, there's some great body contouring tech using hot or cold to basically tell fat cells to die. Some are better than others. Some are very much practitioner dependent, uh, which does have some inherent issues in and of itself. Uh, because something very real in the medical aesthetics industry is the era of the lazy laser technician. And there's actually a piece of tech that's just come out on the market that kind of uses like GPS to make sure that the pulses of energy are, are evenly scattered and placed on the area that's being targeted for more collagen, for reds and for browns. So we're kind of seeing this become taken out of the equation a little bit, which is really interesting. I definitely think that where things are going, I'm in alignment with you with the nutrition, with the weight loss um, press that's been happening over the last year or two. But I think in general, people are just wanting to look and feel their best. They just don't know what those options are. And I know because Daniel, you and I both work with so many different practices and clinicians. What really is something that uh, an individual who's seeking rejuvenation really want to be looking for? Uh, obviously, in my one-on-one sessions, I get it, I get insights into what those skin goals are, and then mention where to go and what to do. But I'm just really curious, in your opinion, Daniel, working with you know a number of practices as well, what really makes some practices stand out, in your opinion? Yeah, I think that what makes some practices really stand out, one obviously is experience. I think that's kind of a no-brainer. But I think that the other one is really going to be how they how they look at what they do. Um, so let me explain that a little bit more. Is that you want to take a look and see the way that some people do some things is kind of how they do everything. So if you're seeing that, oh, if the office is a little bit dirty when you get in there, if you see that they're maybe not, not so on point, they're maybe not as detailed, maybe there's not so much life in when they talk, maybe if you look them up online, there's just not much there. That's indicative of, hey, if this is what they're doing for their own business, for themselves, for their name, if they're not so detailed, if they're not so um, into it or not really looking at it, how detailed are they going to be with you? How excited are they going to be about getting you a result when in their own lives, their own business, it looks like it's not really being taken care of. So I think taking a look and seeing what are the small things that they are doing or not doing is going to be a bit telling on what they're going to do on the important things. So particularly if someone, if any of your listeners are looking for that medical practitioner, I think kind of taking a quick look at them online seeing what they look like from an online perspective and even going and talking to them, like going into their office and talking with them. I mean, almost everyone offers some type of free consultation. Um, the ones that charge, I would actually say that they're probably a little bit more advanced uh, because they know the value of their time. So if anything, if someone is going to ask me for, hey, I need a credit card to hold um, your appointment or, hey, there's like a $20 booking fee just to see the doctor, I actually think that's a good thing because if the doctor is doing that, then they're like, then they've been in business a long time. People want to see them. They're very busy. And so if everyone wants to see them, they're probably doing good work. So that's just a couple of things that I would look at when you're looking, trying to figure out, is this the right person for me or not? And I think even when you talk with them, kind of get an idea of what are they really passionate about? Like if they are really passionate about health about and they spend time on their ongoing education outside of just the regular medical education, but hey, is this something that they'd like to read up on and learn about in their free time? And I think that's also going to be very telling because they're going to be on the edge of what is the latest, what is the greatest, and letting you know that as well and getting you the best results. Yeah, absolutely. The personality match here is so key. So say, for example, you're in a busy metropolitan area, big city, there's going to be different pockets where the culture 
is a bit different. And one thing about culture that I think is worthwhile is uh, talking about is medical tourism. I actually have had two clients of mine have facelifts outside of the country. One was in Korea and the other was in Mexico. And the lady who had a Korean facelift, she ended up looking Korean afterwards. Mm -hmm. And she's a Caucasian woman. So something to consider there. Yeah. And then also uh, with the lady who had a facelift in Mexico, she actually had sutures remaining that I had to remove on her that were left in. So not a fan of the medical tourism. So I, you know, staying local as much as you can, if you need to have that follow up, I think is really wise and having that culturally appropriate rejuvenation. But when practitioners start to show up online, it's basically like you are getting a snapshot as to like an interview with them. You're kind of interviewing them in a way online, how they show up, how they speak, how they present, what are some of their values, what are some of their interests. And I know for myself, when I started to integrate the biohacking, the longevity, the health side of things, because I just saw it providing uh, those that did that had better outcomes then it was almost like this value add that I was able to bring to the table uh, in how I provide care as well, which was neat. And uh, obviously charging the fee is super important. And I love what you said about look up practitioners. I mean, this relates to absolutely everything, like your lawyer, uh, who you're going to pay to have some type of service done. Check them out online. Are they showing up? How do they speak? What's your personality like? Do you get a good sense of them? And I actually encourage everyone to take this into when you're getting information for the, the health side of things, for the longevity side of things. Are you listening? And is there sort of like a peaceful nature to it? Or is it really intense and you know, keeping you in that high beta state too? Um, these are all things to consider. What are their eyes doing? Are their eyes darting everywhere this way, that way? And that's where NLP kind of comes in to discern if someone's going to be good to work with or even have in your life in general. So I'm, I'm curious, Daniel, if you have uh, any sort of remarks to add that's uh, popping up from what I just mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you really hit it on the head, like taking a look, seeing what they're doing online. And I think the biggest thing is kind of what, how you do anything is how you do everything. And I think that equally applies to the people that you are looking up. Um, and kind of, as I mentioned before, if you're seeing kind of small little things that just don't seem right, um, I think that's going to be very indicative of how they're going to look at this from a long-term perspective. So, and again, like when it comes to I guess pricing, like you kind of mentioned the medical tourism. I know a lot of people look at this from a cost perspective and nothing against that, but particularly when it comes to aesthetics, one thing that I see happen quite often is that people try and go the cheap route and they put more emphasis on cost than quality. And what often happens is that they go the cheap route, they go to a provider that is not as experienced, that's not as good and is cheaper because they're not as experienced. And then that provider messes up or makes a mistake. Then they have to go back to the experienced person, pay their regular fee, to, or actually pay more because they have to undo the damage that was done and then get it done properly, whereas they should have just got it done right the first time. And they end up spending more money, more time, and there's just more pain they go through. So, I mean, when it comes to your health and your looks, it's not something that you should go cheap on. Like there's a few things that yes, you can go cheap on, but I think when it comes to your health, that's the thing you do not go cheap on. That's the thing. If you're going to spend, you spend on your health and you don't try and go cheap there. Oh yes. The social media side of things of, you know, clinics doctoring their photos or saying this is from one procedure, but it's also from multiple. My best before and after photos have been with working with uh, clients over one to two years where we've been able to do the skincare, maybe some injectables, some laser, maybe they had upper eyelid surgery, and they're starting to integrate this healthy living also to the mix. So it's not going to be a quick fix. It's going to be, you know, give yourself really one to two years for those really noticeable lasting 
changes, especially from the skin quality with collagen and elastin, skin tone and texture improvement. It takes time. And the cheap route is like that magic bullet, that magic cream, that new product or or technology that's just come on the market. Um, cost over quality is huge. I know we're seeing a lot in the turkey space of these very transformative, remarkable before and afters. And I'm actually looking at some of the surgical procedures. And because I come from oculoplastics with eyelid surgery, brow lifts, I'm seeing some really strange things that are being done that typically wouldn't be done in a professional setting here in North America. So there's also this concept of, you know, what do you want to address? Do you want to address the upper eyelids or lower eye bags? That's going to be an oculoplastic surgeon. Are you looking to do a facelift? That's going to be a plastic surgeon who specializes in facelifts. Are you looking for breast augmentation? Go to a plastic surgeon that specializes in that. If you're looking for liposuction or a tummy tuck or body contouring, looking for practitioners that really that is their niche and that's what they focus on as opposed to sort of like the jack of all trades uh, that are out there as well. I know you know that, yeah. <laughs> Daniel. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, kind of getting, going back to you don't want to go cheap on your health. I mean, you really want to get quality first. And that quality, kind of to your point, it could be here in the US, it could be in Turkey, it could be in Korea, it could be in Mexico. But I mean, I think the biggest thing to focus on is who is the best person for the job. Now, I'm not opposed to traveling if they really are the best, but I'm not looking at, oh, this person in the US is, is the best. There's someone that's okay in Mexico and they're a third of the price, then I'm not going to go to the Mexico person. But if someone in the U.S. is just as good as someone in Mexico and the Mexico one is a third of the price, okay, that's fine then. But you are focusing on quality first. I think that's what everyone needs to focus on when it comes to their health and their looks. Look and see who is the best person to do this for you. Mm -hmm. And even language. So this this one client that went overseas uh, to the Orient, she tried to do some follow-up and the staff were different. They didn't speak the language. Mm -hmm. So these are all kind of like interesting behind the scenes things that you might not have thought about tuning into the show here that happen in the medical aesthetic space in the process and evolution of clinics, of clinicians. Really, there are going to be those out there who are doing their best to stay at the top of their game. And then there's also those who are, you know, they know everything. They might be a cowboy. They're always doing the new things. There's so many different categories and buckets of different types of practitioners based on the way that they operate that I just kind of mentioned there. So look for someone who provides those consistent results, shows up consistently online like Danielle, you mentioned, and I know you also help practitioners learning how to show up online too, which is great. Rising tide lifts all boats. And mm -hmm. it's always good to see, you know, colleagues in the space, what we're seeing, where we see the industry going. And for you to kind of get that behind the scenes look into these things as well, I'm sure is interesting for you listening. So Daniel, thank you so much for being here on the School of Radiance podcast. Where can people learn more about you? Yeah, they can look me up on uh, our website, which is www.edna, E-D-N-A, digitalmarketing.com. Perfect. And be sure to check out the interview because you initially had reached out to me to interview me on where I think the industry is going. And where can people check out that interview as well? Yeah, the guys you see on the website as well is just in the uh, podcast section and they can uh, see the interview that we did together. Yeah, that was a fun one. You asked some great questions and I always love to be asked about the behind the scenes things and just continue to grow and elevate the medical aesthetics industry. It's, it's an incredible industry to be a part of as a practitioner myself. But boy, when you think you know everything, you know nothing. Mm -hmm. There's always new things coming out on the market. We touched on the weight loss side of things. That's been huge over the last year, year and a half I wish I bought some stocks <laughs> in that particular product. And I'm sure yeah. you did too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Be sure to check out the show notes of this episode to you know check out that podcast that Daniel and I had. And I reached out to him as well. And feel free to 
head on over to the school of radiance.com for all your skincare booking your one-on-one -on -one with me while I still do them online with my availability uh, tutorials and also the membership. And I hope you all have a beautiful high vibe radiant rest of your day. And now you're just a little bit wiser about the inside scoop and where things are going in the medical aesthetics industry. Thank you so much, Daniel Gao, for being here on the show. And I look My forward pleasure. to connecting with you all very soon, right here on the School of Radiance podcast.